the first particle accelerators were built in the 19th century in the form of cathode ray tubes. For those old enough, this is how ancient television sets were built. The particles accelerated are electrons. To probe the interior of the atom, a natural particle accelerator provided by radioactive decay was used. The experiments were performed between 1908 and 1913 by Hans Geiger and Ernest Marsden under the direction of Ernest Rutherford at the physical laboratories of the University of Manchester. Naturally admitted helium ions were aimed at gold foil where they bounced off of the much heavier nuclei. In order to smash the nuclei apart to see what made them tick, required projectiles of much higher velocities. Ernest Rutherford was exploring the structure of the atom. With his famous 1934 experiment, he showed the fusion of deuterium and helium and observed, quote, an enormous effect was produced during the process. Arthur Eddington had suggested that fusion energy fueled the sun and other stars. It was in this context, perhaps, that physicists assumed fusion may only occur at high temperatures and pressures. What if this were not the case? What if the billions of cells in your body already possessed the talent of alchemy? As in so many areas of biology, we're constantly discovering the ingenious products of evolution. In four billion years, the number of experiments done in that regime is unfathomable. For other hints and surprises, I suggest my podcast called Quantum Cabbages. Even those knowing little of nuclear physics are familiar with the term cold fusion. For most of us, it evokes the idea of shoddy experiments at best and scientific fraud at the worst. For listeners to this podcast, you know of my disdain for the phrase Trust the science. Earlier episodes outlined cases from the 19th century to present of the loftiest institutions peddling pure nonsense. Stanley Pons and Martin Fleischmann announced in 1989 that they had fused atoms in their laboratory without the aid of nuclear reactor or particle accelerator. They were widely ridiculed in the media and the scientific community. Martin Fleischmann passed away on August 3rd, 2022, after a long struggle with Parkinson's disease. Possible fusion of atoms at temperatures far lower than those known to occur in stars or accelerators gave rise to the term cold fusion. Scientists then and now familiar with the procedures of Pons and Fleischmann believe that they were flawed and the conclusions mistaken. Several attempts to reproduce the results failed to detect excess energy resulting from fusion. It may be the case that such energies were too small to detect or that such reactions did not occur. We won't comment on that here. I will note that Pons and Fleischmann were both chemists, discovering something that nearly all nuclear physicists claimed to be impossible probably did not endear them to that community. As a brief reminder, we know of two nuclear processes which release energy. These are fission and fusion. When an atomic nucleus consisting of protons and neutrons decays naturally, or is triggered to do so in a reactor, it splits to yield a nuclei of two or more lighter elements. The splitting is naturally called fission. Most often, an alpha particle consisting of two protons and two neutrons is released with great velocity. This is the nucleus of a helium atom. The release of binding energy with the high velocities of the daughter particles slamming into surrounding atoms generates heat. This heat is used to run a Stirling engine or steam to drive a turbine. The mechanical energy turns a dynamo to generate electric current. This is the process at the heart of every commercial nuclear power plant. When nuclei of two lighter elements are driven together with enough velocity, they may combine into a heavier element. This process is called fusion. The total mass of the constituent elements is greater than that of the resulting nucleus. Though the total number of protons and neutrons remains the same, 
the small amount of mass disappears. When the nuclei fuse, this mass difference is transformed into energy for the equation E equals mc squared. This is Einstein's formula for the equivalence of mass and energy. The energy used to force the nuclei together is still much smaller than the yield in fusion. For this reason, a controlled sustainable fusion reaction has long been sought. Decade after decade, billions of dollars are spent to develop a reactor which produces more power than it consumes. The atoms involved are hydrogen, helium, and lithium, and would not create any dangerous nuclear waste. The difference between fission and fusion was briefly reviewed here for clarity. The primary reason offered for the rejection of Pons and Fleischmann's results was the failure to detect the energy arising from fusion by those attempting to reproduce it. This energy would have manifested as heat or a rise in temperature detected by a calorimeter. The two chemists claimed they did see a dramatic rise from 30 degrees C to 50 degrees C. As mentioned, thermal energy is just one part of any proof for fusion. The other part is, of course, the resulting heavier element. I'm not clear on what Pons and Fleischmann were trying to fuse in order to release energy. Hydrogen will diffuse into palladium, which they use for their electrodes. Naturally, the reduction in constituent elements and the appearance of new elements within a closed system would be unambiguous proof of fusion. At least this makes logical sense provided such elements are detectable. Such an experiment was conducted by Renzo Mondaini in which sulfur was produced, most likely from the fusion of oxygen atoms. His electrolysis setup used purified water and 12 volts supplied to copper electrodes suspended in the beaker. Oxygen has an atomic number of 8 and sulfur has an atomic number of 16. Theory says that the mass difference implies energies far higher than those obtained in electrolysis would be required. In his apparatus, he observed bubbles arising from one electrode, while on the other, an accumulation of oxygen bubbles should have been present. Instead, what appeared were blue-green crystals consisting of copper sulfate and copper sulfide crystals. Analysis of the water and the crystals measured significant quantities of copper sulfide and copper sulfate. The electrode that should have been emitting oxygen bubbles instead is quickly encrusted with crystals. These crystals will cover the electrode until the reaction stops unless brushed off. The reaction described does not sound like one deficient in energy. Analysis by an outside lab verified the presence of sulfur, which did not originally exist in either the electrodes or solution. The Mondaini experiment is shown on YouTube. If this experiment, done for less than $50, shows that cold fusion is possible at room temperature, then that should be cause for embarrassment for a nuclear scientist. In a single nuclear physics paper, there could be hundreds of co-authors. No doubt they have made many interesting discoveries since World War II, but have they been researching the right areas? The Large Hadron Collider, or CERN, now wants $48 billion to build an ever larger, more powerful collider. But is it worth it? At least in the United States, the superconducting super collider was killed in its crib. In the last 40 years, the only significant discovery has been the verification of the Higgs boson. The first case of cold fusion outlined is rather obscure, or at least the video is 10 years old. If the results are valid, this is not a viable source for power, but it is interesting. The appearance of sulfur, where there was none, should poke holes in what the nuclear physicists have assumed for 70 years. Other studies are just as intriguing with more profound implications. This is the prospect of nuclear transmutation in biological organisms. Plants or animals may find themselves in an environment where vital elements are lacking. 
Is it possible that they could recreate them from other elements to which they do have access? Consignment to scientific purgatory is a recurring theme in academia. Pons and Fleischmann were not the first to be pilloried, whether rightly or wrongly. From 1875 to 1883, a German biologist named von Herzl undertook a great number of experiments in Berlin, which so outraged the scientific community that his books were removed from libraries and his writings banned. The subject that so teed off his colleagues remains a taboo question that can scarcely be mentioned in polite scientific circles. It is the apparently innocent question, where do the minerals in plants come from? Von Herzl grew plants hydroponically using solutions whose mineral content he measured and controlled. Like preceding investigators in England, France, and Germany, he found that there were elements in the ashes of the plants he grew that could not be sourced from the growth medium. He concluded that plants are capable of affecting the transmutation of elements. Excommunication from the ivory tower inevitably followed, and it was not until the 1940s that open-minded biologists rediscovered von Herzl's work and tried to replicate it. Monsieur Baranger of the École Polytechnique Paris decided to repeat von Herzl's experiments, but with higher controls and greater precautions against error through a much larger number of experiments. The study lasted four years and involved thousands of analyses. Baranger measured the phosphorus, potassium, and calcium content to, of vetch seeds before and after germination in twice distilled water. In some cases, pure calcium chloride was added. Baranger found that in the case of seeds germinated using added calcium chloride, they experienced a 10% increase in their potassium content and a significant decrease in their phosphor content. He concluded, quote, these results obtained by taking all possible precautions confirm the general conclusions proposed by von Herzl and lead one to think that under certain conditions, the plants are capable of forming elements which did not exist before in the external environment. Since that time, further experiments have confirmed these general findings. In 1946, the director of the Dinard Maritime Laboratory, Henri Spindler, investigated seaweed and found that the algae laminaria manufactured iodine out of water which did not contain this element. In 1959, Dr. Julian at the University of Beskanal found in placing tenches into water containing 14% sodium chloride, their production of potassium chloride increased by 36% within four hours. And in 1965, H. Kalmaki, professor of applied microbiology at Mukugawa University, Japan, reported the formation of phosphorus in a wide range of microorganisms grown in a medium deficient in phosphorus. Komaski suggested that nuclear reactions were taking place in the cells of the microorganisms. The best known modern researcher of biological transmutation was Louis Kervran at the University of Paris. Kervran was nominated for a Nobel Prize for his work in this field. He elucidated many of the nuclear reactions involved and sought to explain them. Quote, the vital phenomenon is not of a chemical order, he says. The nucleus of the atom in light elements is quite different from what nuclear physics regards as the average type, the latter having value only for heavy elements. Nature moves particles from one nucleus to another. Particles such as hydrogen and oxygen nuclei, and in some cases, the nuclei of carbon and lithium, unquote. Biological transmutation, said Kervan, is a phenomenon completely different from the atomic fission or fusion of physics. Stimulated by Kervan's results, other laboratories have conducted experiments, many obtaining similar results. 
1971, the labs of the French Society of Agriculture tried germinating rye seeds. They found that the initial input of 13.3 milligrams of magnesium dropped as low as 3.2 milligrams, a fall of 335%, while the initial input of 7.3 milligrams of potassium rose to 16.6 milligrams, an increase of 133%. In full disclosure, scientists at other institutions have attempted to replicate these results and have found no evidence of transmutation. For instance, Professor Jungerman at the University of California in 1977 and Carolyn Damon of the U.S. Customs in 1978. Another curious situation arises in single-celled animals that comprise nearly half the biomass on Earth. Those would be diatoms or the many species of algae living in both fresh and salt water. Diatoms create beautiful skeletons comprised of silica or silicon dioxide. The question is, where does the silicon come from to build them? Silicon is not in abundance as it does not readily dissolve in water. The amount of silicon present is only one part per million. Phosphorus, on the other hand, is readily available. The phosphorus nucleus has just one more proton than that of silicon. Likewise, chickens living in an area deficient of calcium manage to produce viable eggshells containing 94% calcite, a stable form of calcium carbonate. That is 2.7 grams for every 60 gram egg. Again, the question is where does the needed calcium come from? The answer may lie in that where the calcium is lacking, potassium may be far more abundant. Potassium has one proton more than calcium and is more readily available. In 1978, Solomon Goldfine in the U.S. Army's Material Laboratory at Fort Belvoir suggested a possible mechanism for biological transmutations. He suggests that such transmutations would most likely involve an organic molecule with a central metal atom, magnesium adenosine triphosphate, or MGATP. Goldfine proposed that a stack of these molecules could form a helical chain. The magnesium ATP could also produce oscillating electric currents, which act as a micro-miniature cyclotron, accelerating hydrogen ions to speeds near that speed of light and giving them enough potential to transmute an element to the next highest atomic number. The mechanism proposed by a gold fine is analogous to a modern particle accelerator built on a molecular scale. The proton resides inside a tube. Electromagnetic pulses are coordinated into the body of that tube, time to push it forward. The idea is not so far-fetched given the many other examples we have in nature. Evolution has created molecular motors driving the flagella of single-celled organisms, for example, to drive hundreds of tiny oars or large switching tails. So has nature endowed our bodies with billions of particle accelerators? In my mind, the jury is still out. Are the thousands of nuclear scientists of the world just trying to protect their jobs and reputations? And what is the numerous enterprises profiting from the construction of super colliders and tokamak generators always 30 years away from viability. There are billions of euros and dollars at stake in questioning long-held dogma.